Well, good morning, Christ Walk Church. How is everybody doing today? Man, I am excited to be here for Pentecost Sunday. Um, yeah, 50 days after Easter, we celebrate every single year um, that original outpouring of God's Spirit upon His people. And it is incredible to me that um, for over 2,000 years, like there, there's this movement that has continued to grow and to develop. And because of that, that initial day of Pentecost, that, that initial outpouring of God's Spirit, when uh, 120 people gathered together in an upper room seeking what the Lord was going to do next, and he poured his spirit out upon them. And then later on that day, 3,000 were added to the church. And we are a part of that movement here some 2,000 years later. And it is showing no signs of slowing down. And that group of a little over 3,000 has now turned into billions around the world. That it's not just who's in these four walls this morning, that we are a part of something so much bigger than ourselves. And so that is a reason for us to celebrate this morning. Amen? Amen. Amen. If you got your Bible, you got a smart device, turn with me uh, or swipe with me. Once again, we're going to find ourselves in uh, Paul's letter to the Colossians. So the New Testament, Colossians uh, chapter 2, and we're going to pick up in verse 13 here together in just a minute. Uh, but before we do that, you know, I was, I was thinking back um, to Luke's first Christmas. Uh, I've been doing some reminiscing here lately, uh, as on Friday, um, we're going to gather together with some family and friends, and we're going to watch Luke uh, walk across the stage and, and graduate from high school, along with um, several others that are a part of, of our church. Um, but I, I was thinking back to Luke's first Christmas. It was, it was our first Christmas as parents, and so we wanted to make sure that it was very special. And admittedly, we may have gone a little bit overboard considering the fact that he was only 11 months old at the time. But I can remember that evening vivid, vividly. Um, we had come home from the Christmas Eve service at the church that we were a part of in Jacksonville. And um, we had gotten him settled down and, and off to bed. And, and he had fallen asleep. And so we got everything out and we set up all the gifts and the toys as aesthetically pleasing as possible, you know, underneath the tree, like he would know the difference or even care. And it was getting late in the evening. Everything was picture perfect. Santa's cookies were on the plate by the tree. We had gone outside and sprinkled the reindeer food in the yard. Um, you know, we had, we had read, Twas the Night Before Christmas, and we had read Luke chapter 2, and it was, it was all of the traditions, all of the boxes were checked, and everything was, was screwed in or snapped together, all the decals had been put on, and Sarah and I were getting ready to turn in for the night, until I read a phrase on the side of one of the packages of Luke's toys that threw me into a panic. It said, batteries not included. And I thought, how in the world did we forget the batteries? If Luke were to wake up to all of these new toys the next morning to find that none of them worked, his first Christmas was going to be ruined. Little did we know in that moment that he would just want to play with the boxes and not the toys that came in them. But, but uh, in, in a rush, I, I quickly tallied up all the different battery types and quantities that were needed. I grabbed my keys, put on my shoes, and I head, headed out in a midnight mad dash to the store to spend a small fortune in batteries um, to ensure that everything would work properly. No doubt that phrase, batteries not included, has plagued many a parent over the years. That the toy by itself wasn't enough. There was something extra that was required to make it all work. Today we're continuing our series called Supreme, where we've been walking through Paul's letter to the Colossians. And in this letter, Paul addresses some false teachings that were beginning to creep into the church in Colossae and in the surrounding areas that were attempting to diminish both the sovereignty and the supremacy of Jesus Christ. 
And up to this point in our series, we've covered the foundation that Paul has laid to establish Christ as supreme over all, along with some general warnings to the Colossians regarding these false teachings that were making their way in the church. And as we work through our text for today, we're going to see that things begin to shift quite drastically from general warnings to specific warnings as Paul begins to call out these false teachings by name in the second part of chapter 2. And so um, this morning we're going to begin with where we left off last week. In case you're unaware, each message in this series it builds on the one before it. So if you've missed any of these messages, you can go back and, and watch on our YouTube channel, listen on our podcast um, channel so that you can catch up. But, but here's where we finished off with last week. Picking up in Colossians chapter 2, verse 13. Um, hopefully you've turned there with me by this point. I'm reading out of the New Living Translation. Paul writes this. He says, you were dead because of your sins and because your sinful nature was not yet cut away. Then God made you alive with Christ, for he forgave all your sins. He canceled the record of the charges against us and took it away by nailing it to the cross. And in this way, he disarmed the spiritual rulers and authorities. He shamed them publicly by his victory over them on the cross. And it's these few verses that serve as a pivotal moment in Paul's letter to the Colossians. Here, things begin to shift from the factual evidence that Paul uses to establish the supremacy of Christ to a more practical nuts and bolts kind of approach that Paul is providing for how we as believers are to live in the light of the fact that Christ is supreme over all. And in verses 13 through 15, Paul reminds us of who we used to be before stepping into right relationship with Jesus. He says that we were dead as a result of our sinful actions and our sinful nature. But now we have been made alive in Christ because he has forgiven us of our sins. And this was all made possible due in part to Jesus' work on the cross. That Jesus' crucifixion, that it brought about ultimate and final victory over sin. And so for those of us that have placed our hope and trust in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, that means that, that there is nothing else that is needed in order to make it work. Everything has been included and provided. There, there, is, nothing, there is nothing that is missing. There is no additional requirement. That when Jesus said, it is finished on the cross, he ended that sentence with a period, not a question mark. See, but despite that, there were, there were some in the church that they weren't so sure that was the case. And as a result, they, they began to perpetuate this idea that, that salvation in Jesus may be a little bit more complex. And it's here that Paul takes issue with those teachings head on by calling them on the carpet. And so for the remainder of our time today, it's going to be my attempt to help us discover Paul's identification of the false teachings that were plaguing the church, his indictment of those false teachings, and then his intentions for us as believers as a result. And so if you're taking notes, perhaps you want to write these down. Number one, Paul's identification of false teachings. Paul's identification of false teachings. We pick up in verse 16 of Colossians 2. He writes, so don't let anyone condemn you for what you eat or drink or for not celebrating certain holy days or new moon ceremonies or Sabbaths. For these rules are only shadows of the reality yet to come. And Christ himself is that reality. Don't let anyone condemn you by insisting on pious self-denial or the worship of angels saying that they have had visions about these things. So Paul, right here, he begins to call out these false teachings, ultimately by name. False teaching number one that he identifies is the false teaching of legalism. According to Jewish law, Jews were required to eat a kosher diet daily. They were to practice a weekly Sabbath. They were to celebrate the beginning of each month with a litany of special prayers and services. And they were to observe annual holy days and feasts. 
as a part of their worship unto the Lord. And this was in accordance with the Old Testament law that was given to Moses. But here in Colossae, the Colossians, they would have been Gentiles. And placing the responsibility of the Mosaic law on them was an attempt by the Jews to somehow disqualify these Gentiles from membership among God's people. And in essence, what they were asking is, do you want to be saved? Well, then you got to follow all these rules. And, and this, admittedly, this is the default mode for a lot of Christians, a lot of pastors. Sometimes I slip into this mindset as well here all these years later, but it's also not true. All you have to do to be saved is just to believe on Jesus. That's it. And, and there are dangers that are brought on by legalism and a legalistic mindset and attitude. The danger of rigidity, that legalism can lead to a rigid adherence to rules and regulations without consideration to context or for compassion. There's the danger of judgmentalism that comes along with legalism, that these attitudes often result in a judgmental approach toward others who don't adhere to the same standards or the interpretations of the laws. And, and this ultimately creates an atmosphere of superiority and, and exclusion, which leads to damaging relationships and the fostering of division within the church. There's also a, a loss of essence where... When we focus solely on the external compliance with the rules, that, that can lead to a loss of deeper essence and the spirit behind those rules. And this can result in a hollow form of spirituality or morality, where the letter of the law is followed, but the underlying principles of love and compassion and forgiveness are neglected. And, and Jesus confronted the Pharisees head on for this exact type of behavior. Paul says in, in verse 17 that these rules that are brought on by the concept of legalism, that they are only shadows of reality. See, all a shadow does is prove the sunshine. It points us to the source. The, the shadow is not the substance itself. It, is, it, it points us to that substance. The shadow of the law, of the rules, points us to the substance of Jesus Christ, who is the reality and the fulfillment of that law. Let me be very clear this morning. Just like I talked about in previous messages of this series. And, and, and don't, don't hear what I'm not saying and don't hear what Paul's not saying. There is a definitive right way and wrong way for us to live. And, and make no mistake about it. Following God's rules and living his way is most definitely beneficial. But what we're, what we're going to see here is there, there's a, a pattern established in this section. And it begins right here, is that we do these things, we, we live this way in accordance with these rules and guidelines because we are saved, not so that we can be saved. Amen. And see, there's a difference there. False teaching of legalism, number two, Paul addresses the false teaching of asceticism. Asceticism is the practice of severe self-discipline and abstention from indulgence. And Paul refers to this in this passage as pious self-denial. In this instance, it likely refers to fasting, abstaining from certain foods or perhaps eating altogether, Though aesthetic practices can certainly be things above and beyond fasting with an, an, an emphasis on their severity. And this asceticism, it was legalism to the nth degree, all the way to the extreme. It was pushing the envelope of legalism. And this teaching was being perpetuated, uh, the, the teaching that was being perpetuated is that this type of ascetic behavior would allow one to gain merit with God. That, that somehow because we deprive ourselves of certain things or we neglect certain areas that, that God may love us more and he may accept us at a higher level. And there's a danger that comes along with asceticism. 
Asceticism puts all the focus on the person that is depriving themselves rather than placing the focus on Jesus and his work on the cross. That and, and it, it's sufficiency. And, and it suggests that, that one is somehow more holy or more spiritually superior because of the things that they choose to avoid or the areas of their life that they neglect. And again, can actions like fasting be beneficial in the life of the believer and help us to grow spiritually? Certainly. Absolutely they can. But nothing that you or I could ever do in our own bodies will ever be enough for us to save ourselves or to gain our own righteousness. That only comes by way of the cross through the grace of Jesus Christ. And so here we see that pattern again. We practice these things like fasting to grow closer to God because we are saved, not so that we can be saved false teaching of legalism, the false teaching of asceticism. Number three, Paul addresses the false teaching of mysticism. Mysticism. Apparently there were some in the church that had begun to worship angels. And they likened this to a deeply moving spiritual experience that set them apart from others and made them out to be closer to the Lord. And they positioned themselves so as to not be challenged on this because they said, like, this is the experience that I've had, uh, that that they they had had visions about these things. And so they they took the approach of, oh, you, you haven't had a vision like this? Well, you must not be spiritually elite like I am. If you're not having these experiences, then then maybe you're just not as good. You're just not as close to the Lord as I am. Maybe you need to seek some other things. And here's the danger of mysticism. Mysticism causes one to chase after spiritual experiences rather than chase after Jesus. Make no mistake about it this morning. It is idolatry in its purest form. It's when we begin to worship the creation rather than worship the creator. And and I've come to discover that there's a lot of people in the world and there's a whole lot of people in the church that they say uh, that we want to be spiritual people. We want to be very spiritual. Guess what? The devil is also spiritual. And there's a lot of people in the church that they are chasing after a spiritual high. That, that they want to go to the place that it, it has the, the packed auditorium, the packed worship facility where all of the people are. Or, or they want to sing that certain song that triggers all of the emotions. Or, or they want uh, to, to sit under a charismatic speaker who, who teaches from the Bible. And they will, they will hop around from church to church and place to place, chasing after all of those things until they eventually find it. And when it dries up there, they'll go to the next place. And the truth is, had they just spent time chasing Jesus Monday through Saturday, they wouldn't have to come into church on Sunday to get their fix because they would have already experienced it. And instead of coming to get it, they would be bringing it with them when they show up. Just going to let that sit right there for just a second. Now, see, there, there is nothing wrong with a large gathering of people in a a worship space. There there is nothing wrong with emotional worship music. There is nothing wrong with charismatic preaching and teaching. I love all of those things. But when we allow those things to become the focus rather than our pursuit of Jesus, our salvation, our our spiritual status are, are linked in with them, then we've missed the mark entirely. Do we need to desire for more deeply moving spiritual experiences? Yes, unequivocally, absolutely, wholeheartedly we do. But having those experiences is not what saves us. We don't go to church with a group of people so we can be saved. We don't sing worship songs and and, and raise our hands and bow a knee and shed a tear so that we can be saved. We don't sit under charismatic preaching and teaching so we can be saved. We do those things because we are saved. And that is The difference, there's the pattern here that Paul is saying there is nothing else needed. 
It's not about the rules. It's not about self-denial and deprivation. It's not about these mountaintop experiences. It's all about Jesus, his identification of false teachings. Number two, Paul's indictment of those false teachings. His indictment of those false teachings. Picking up in the latter part of verse 18, he says, Their sinful minds have made them proud. They are not connected to Christ, the head of the body. For he holds the whole body together with its joints and ligaments, and it grows as God nourishes it. When I read this passage, I, I have to cue the law and order. Dun, dun, you know, like, because that's Paul. He's being, like, direct. He's saying, these people, they're, they're full of pride. They're not even connected to Jesus, he's pronouncing a verdict on these teachings and those who procl- proclaim them, saying that they are driven by pride. Pride is, is a high or inordinate opinion of one's own dignity, importance, merit, or superiority. These people wrongly attempt to place themselves above the status of Jesus. They are saying, look at me and what I am doing Instead of look at Jesus and what he has done. They're driven by pride. He says they are disconnected from the head. Think about that. When you sever the head of something, it dies. And our source of life, the the body of Christ under the headship of Jesus, the, the church, our source of life is Jesus Christ as the head. But these people were not connected, uh, they were not connected into their source of life, and so instead they had chosen to go their own way, that they were remaining dead in the sin that Jesus Christ had died to set them free from. They were driven by pride, they were disconnected from the head, and everything that they were doing was dependent on works. They believe that their salvation and their ability to belong to the body, to be a part, was a result of what they had done. But yet, Paul reminds us that it's Christ who holds the whole body, who holds the church together. And that body and its members grows as he nourishes it. That he is sovereign and supreme, and we get fed from nowhere else but by his hand. That God is the one who grows the church. God is the one who raises up those believers and develops them. That there's nothing that you and I could do. It's because of everything that Christ has done for us. That's how we grow and develop. That's how we become who we've been called to be in Jesus. Not out of our own efforts, but because of the work that Christ has done on our behalf. Paul identifies the false teaching. He indicts the false teaching. And then we close with Paul's intention for the believers. Paul's intention for believers. Picking up in verse 20 of Colossians 2, he says, you have died with Christ and he has set you free from the spiritual powers of this world. So why do you keep on following the rules of the world? Such as don't handle, don't taste, Don't touch. Such rules are mere human teachings about things that deteriorate as we use them. These rules may seem wise because they require strong devotion, pious self-denial, and severe bodily discipline. But they provide no help in conquering a person's evil desires. See, Paul reminds us that we died with Christ. And if we died with him, then subsequently we are made alive with him. He reminds us that we have been delivered from the spiritual powers of the world. So he says, don't be determined to follow the rules of the world any longer that you have been delivered from. He's pointing back to the law. He said, here's the thing about the law. Here's the thing about the rules is that the law is only good until we miss the mark. Then we have to pay the penalty. Think about it. The the speed limit, it's only good as long as you drive under it. The second you drive over it, you get blue lights in the rear view. They hand you a ticket and you have to pay the penalty. 
All the law can do is simply point out our shortcomings and our ability, our inability to live according to it. The law points out our sin, but it doesn't provide the means to overcome it. That only comes by way of the cross, through which and by which we gain our salvation. That that sacrifice was once and for all. We're no longer, thank God, we are no longer bringing bulls and goats and sheep. And uh, I, I couldn't do all of that. I, I love you. But we, I, I couldn't do that. But when Jesus sacrificed himself on the cross, that was the final sacrifice that was needed. It was it. It is finished. So what do we do instead? How are we to live instead? And in, in Corinthians, another of Paul's letters, he, he suggests an intentional lifestyle of discipline in accordance to the law, not of this world, but in accordance to the law of Christ. 1 Corinthians 9, 19 through 27. It's a big chunk. I'm going to read the whole passage. Paul says, even though I'm a free man with no master, I've become a slave to all people to bring many to Christ. When I was with the Jews, I lived like a Jew to bring the Jews to Christ. And when I was with those who followed the Jewish law, I too lived under that law. Even though I'm not subject to the law, I did this so that I could bring Christ to those who were under the law. When I'm with the Gentiles who do not follow the, the Jewish law, I too live apart from that law so that I can bring them to Christ. But I do not ignore the law of God. I obey the law of Christ. When I'm with those who are weak, I share their weakness. For I want to bring the weak to Christ. Yes, I try to find common ground with everyone, doing everything I can to save some. I do everything to spread the good news and share in its blessings. Don't you realize that in a race, everyone runs, but only one person gets the prize. So, run to win. All athletes are disciplined in their training. They, they do it to win a prize that will fade away, but we do it for an eternal prize. So I run with purpose in every step. I'm not just shadow boxing. I discipline my body like an athlete, training it to do what it should. Otherwise, I fear that after preaching to others, I myself might be disqualified. What was Paul's purpose? To be like Jesus, to live according to his example, and to point others toward him. That's the purpose of Paul's life. That should be our purpose as well. To be like Jesus, to live according to his example, and to point others in his direction. And he says, so I live in accordance with the law of Christ. What's the law of Christ? The law of Christ is that which transcends mere rule-keeping. Focusing instead on the internal transformation and the outward expression of love and compassion. It calls for a deep commitment to living in a way that reflects the character and the teachings of Jesus. Some of the key components are things like, as I already mentioned, love and compassion. That Jesus taught the greatest commandments are to love God with all, with, with, um, all of one's heart, soul, mind, and strength and to love one's neighbor as himself. The principle of, of love is the cornerstone of Christian ethics and behavior. It's displaying um, where we bear one another's burdens. This is talked about in another of Paul's letters in Galatians. It emphasizes the importance of mutual support and emp empathy within the Christian community. And by helping each other through our difficulties and challenges, believers fulfill this law of Christ, embodying the selfless love that Jesus demonstrated. It's living according to the golden rule. Jesus taught this himself, so in everything, do to others what you would have them do to you. It encapsulates the, the essence of the law of Christ, advocating for empathy and kindness and reciprocity. It's founded on forgiveness and grace that Jesus taught his followers to forgive as they had been forgiven, highlighting the transformative power of grace in personal and communal relationships. 
It is a life that is lived under the new covenant, which was established through Jesus' life, his death, and his resurrection. It is characterized by, once again, internal transformation and a direct personal relationship with God, rather than strict adherence to a bunch of external rules and regulations and the legal codes of the Old Testament. And it's indicated by the development of the fruit of the Spirit in one's life. Paul writes about this in Galatians 5 where he says, The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. It's the natural outcome of living under the law of Christ. These virtues grow and develop in the life of the believer, representing the ethical and moral standards that are expected of those that follow after Jesus. See, the the truth of the matter this morning is that there's a lot of things that we don't have to do to be saved. But there's a whole lot more things that we get to do because we are saved. And so in, in this shift, as we continue on into chapter 3, we're, we're going to see Paul start to really drill down. He's going to use a word, since. Since this has happened, now this is how we live. This is the, the pattern. This is the example. This is what we are looking for. But he wants to make sure that we realize that we don't live this way because we are trying to earn favor with the Lord. That was given to us through the blood of Jesus Christ, and there is nothing else needed. We don't do these things so we can be saved. We do this because we are saved, and we have chosen a new way of living. That We have died to our former self, and we are newly alive in Jesus Christ. That those sins, those cravings, those desires of the past, they have been put to rest, and now we want the things of God because we realize their benefit and their blessing in our life. And, and why wouldn't we want these things, if we, if we will trust Jesus with our eternity, his lasting forever, then surely we would also trust him with our life here on earth that is only temporary. And ultimately what Paul is pointing us to here is that God's way is the best way. And so this morning, as I bring this message to a close, I want you to consider this. What have you been trying to add so that you can earn salvation rather than simply receiving it by faith? What have you been trying to add? Well, if I do this, then maybe God would. No, 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 no. What have you been putting above the sovereignty and the supremacy of Jesus Christ that doesn't belong there? Whatever that thing is, we need to repent of it. And we need to tear it down off of that pedestal, that shelf. And we need to put Jesus back in the place where he belongs. That's the call today. If you're here this morning and you say, Pastor Blake, I, I've, I've always tried to live my own way. I've always tried to, tried to earn my way into a relationship with God I've, by doing and, and being these different things, hoping that God would sit up and take notice and that he would somehow accept me. If you're tired of living that dead-end kind of life and you're ready to step in to a relationship with Jesus so that you can be given his righteousness for free because of the work that's done on the cross, that you can be accepted by a holy God who will now look at you through the blood of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. If you've never made that decision, I want to invite you to pray this simple prayer with me as we close out this morning. Can we pray together? Heavenly Father, I admit that I'm a sinner and that I'm lost without you. I believe that Jesus died in my place making a way for us to have a relationship and today I choose to follow Jesus his way for the rest of my life.